Okay. Okay, so Julie, you wanna let us know when everybody has joined? Yes, I can. Um, looks like people are still joining. So yeah, give yeah. folks a minute to get on. All right, everybody, we're just um, waiting for folks to join. We're just gonna give everybody another minute. We'll start our meeting shortly. Thank you. Uh, it looks like everyone's in, Hillary. <clears throat> okay, wonderful. Okay. Um, well, good evening. Oh, I think we have one. I think Sergio and Danielle. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining the Helderberg Neighborhood Association's winter meeting. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share our agenda for the night and then we'll jump right in. We're going to kick off with some introductions. So um, we are very excited that Jennifer Plow, actually, Jennifer, you've got to make sure I'm correcting, pronouncing your name correctly, um, our Albany NORC director of the Albany Neighborhood Naturally Occurring Retirement Community will be joining us tonight. So we'll learn all about the NORC as well as some care practices that we can all um, participate in to, to help promote self-care. Um, we'll be hearing from Officer Gordy McLean, and actually we're going to flip those two agenda items. So Officer McLean, you'll, you'll go right up first. Uh, we've also got some news um, from the organization that we're going to be sharing with everybody. We've got some updates on the Academy Station Post Office. We'll share our treasurer's report, and then we'll welcome our elected officials to share updates as well. Um, so that's the agenda for the evening. Um, now we're going to try something a little different tonight where we want to be more engaging on this Zoom format, which I know is difficult. So um, what we're going to do momentarily is we're going to actually invite everybody to unmute themselves and to go ahead and just share your name. If you want to say what street you're on, that way we can see who's on the call um, and just give everybody a chance to say hello. Um, but first, I just want to say a couple of things um, about Zoom. We are recording this meeting, just so everyone is aware, we like to post it on our YouTube channel for folks who can't make tonight's meeting so that they can all um, catch up and be brought up to speed on what the Neighborhood Association is up to. And, you know, we do apologize. There are some constraints that we've had to put in place from a security perspective. We did have a hacking event last year. So um, we'll unmute everybody for our go around for our introductions, but we will be automatically muting participants after that purely because of security practices to minimize the risk of um, another hacking event. But please, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. You can email us, you can call us. We'll happily follow up if, if needed, if you're calling in from a phone tonight. So just wanted to, to say that. And then lastly, we also you know, wanna sincerely thank our partners at the Albany Public Library uh, Kate is our host tonight. We're using the library's concierge service, which supports neighborhood associations with the Zoom platform. So we're really grateful for that support. And, you know, we're going to continue to monitor COVID. We're going to continue to monitor the open meeting guidelines, uh, Department of Health and CDC public health guidelines, and just figure out as we move forward if we might be able to do a hybrid or in-person meeting down the road. So that's, you know, kind of an influx situation as pandemic has been. Uh, so we'll we'll keep monitoring and, and see moving forward, uh, you know, what we can do with the most effective and safe public meeting format. Um, so with that, let's uh, unmute everybody who could. And um, Violetta, how do you think is the easiest thing to do this? Maybe we'll, this is new for us, so we're trying it out. So maybe we'll start with the board and then okay, so I'm Hillary Papineau. I'm the chair of the Helderberg Neighborhood Association. I live over on Cardinal Ave. Um, Violetta, you want to Hi, I'm Violetta De Rosa. I am the vice chair and new to the board this year, and I live on Grove Avenue. I think I'll go next then. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Julie Rutan. I am a member at large and community liaison for the Heldeberg Neighborhood Association, and I live on Longridge Avenue. 
Danielle Carr, why don't you take it next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Carr. I also live on Lawn Ridge and joined the board in 2022 as a member at large. Uh, hi, I'm Shira Rosenhaft. I'm over on Prospect Terrace and um, I'm handling outreach. I'm new to the board this, this year as well. All right. I think did we get all of our board members. I, I know a couple of folks couldn't make it. Did we miss anybody? Okay, so um, maybe we'll try doing this in alphabetical order. Is that maybe the easiest way to do this, do you think, Violetta? Oh, you're muted. How about I just call on folks? All right, that's a good idea. Let's try that. How about Lynn, you're up. Kate, I'm sorry, I think everybody's muted. Could we... Um, is there a way to automatically unmute everyone? Sorry, I was muted as well. I'm going to allow everyone to unmute themselves. Perfect. Uh, so that you can now click that speaker button. <laughs> I'm uh, Lynn Lakagas. I live on Kyler Avenue. I may be your county legislator. I may not, but I may. <laughs> I'm Leslie Dykeman. I live on Cardinal Avenue. I'm seven houses down from Hillary, so I'm on the first block. And Leslie is our, our membership coordinator guru who has done so much behind the scenes to make sure everyone is on track with their dues and just help make sure everything's accounted for. So a big shout out to Leslie. I'm glad you can join us tonight. Thank you. And I'm going to call on Tony Daniel. <laughs> Okay, Tony, sorry, you, you should be able to unmute yourself. I apologize for the technical issues. Hi, we're Mark and Tony Daniel, and we also live on Cardinal Avenue, um, and we're looking forward to tonight's presentation. Good to see you all. How about Glenn, you're up. Can you see me? No. I don't no. know what to do about that. I can hear and see you, Glenn, but this is Glenn Humphreys. I live on Grove Avenue. Glenn, there's there's at the top of your screen, there's a thing that says stop video or start video. You? Little camera. Click on that. I don't see that, Judy. How about the ellipsis? You see it might be on the bottom of the screen. Sure. It's on the bottom on mine. Mine's on the bottom oh. of the black screen. <laughs> oh, okay. also be your camera's covered. There you go. Whoops. We see hey, you. Hey, Glenn. We see you. I just Success. lost the whole thing. Nope, you're there, Glenn. You're good. Nice to see yeah, you. Yeah, but I lost you. Oh, all right. Well, um, I'll play around. Play around. Now you got to go to gallery view. All right. Tag somebody. Who, who, who else wants to say hello? I'll say hello. I'm, I'm Judy Roshate. I, I live on the corner of Ramsey in New Scotland. Um, I may or may not have been your former common council member. <laughs> I like that, Lynn. <laughs> Glad to be a normal person again. Uh, if you can call me normal. <laughs> How about Leo? Why don't you go up next? Sure. I'm Leo Levy. My wife, Martha, and I lived on Lawn Ridge Avenue for 40 years until about three years ago. We consider ourselves to still be adjunct members of the Hildeberg neighborhood and the association. Uh, and we watched the, the NORC develop uh, with some pleasure. Uh, so uh, uh, this meeting uh, attracted us. Uh, Martha's in the background off screen. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. I miss seeing you on the block, Leo. I, I miss being there, but we, we <laughs> but I'm are glad you're happy where you are. <laughs> Please with where we are, yes. Good, good. Nice to see you. Amy, how about you? Sure. I'm Amy Whitman. 
and I live on uh, Fleetwood Avenue. Uh, and I used to live next door to Glenn and down the road from Violetta and uh, was Me. neighbors with Leslie. Um, oh, I've kind of lived Cardinal all over Avenue. the neighborhood. <laughs> I've lived on Cardinal and Grove and now Fleetwood. I've lived all over the neighborhood wow. since the uh, 1990 or so, I guess I moved to Alden. Mm -hmm. um, and I am also your APAC Ward 9 uh, representative. Um, still kind of learning what that's all about. So don't ask me any hard questions because I'll have to get back to you with answers, but I'm uh, pleased to serve. If you have any uh, po community policing questions, you can direct them my way. Yay, Joe's replacement. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was the he's seventh ward. Mm -hmm. so, so the seventh ward starts at uh, Grove and Glendale. Uh, and uh, Joe yeah. actually stayed on ACPAC, only now he's uh, an at-large member. Mm -hmm. um, who did we miss now? Maybe uh... Zyra. There we go, Zyra. Zyra, I'm Zyra Nealon. Uh, I don't have my camera on. I'm not really sure how, uh, but I'm on Lawn Ridge Avenue, uh, right kitty corner from uh, Julie. And uh, next uh, year I will be on Lawn Ridge for 40 years. So, so great well, welcome neighbor <laughs> how about tiffany hi i'm tiffany i am um, just moved to glendale last june welcome to the neighborhood um and then we have uh how about sergio you go up next Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Sergio Adams. I am um, the council person for the seventh ward, and um, I live over on Irvin Street in the Hudson Park neighborhood. And uh, we have, how about Gordon McLean and McLean and uh, Dan after that? And Justin, how about you guys go one, two, three? Uh, Gordon McLean, Albany Police Department, Community or Neighborhood Engagement Unit. I'm your uh, beat officer. Good evening. I'm Lieutenant Dan Johnson. I'm with the uh, Neighborhood Engagement Unit as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin Wallace. I'm one of three community service officers, and I cover Uptown Zone 11. I guess we, is that everybody now? No, I can have some talk. Um, I think that might have been Dan. Was that Dan? Who's on an iPad? No, we have that. So these are people that are being forced out of apartments and homes because of these rising. We don't know. So, all right. I guess we're ready. If that's everyone, we can move on. All right, Julie, take us away. Sure. Um, first up on our agenda is our neighborhood engagement officer, um, Officer Gordy McLean. He handles all the uh, issues around the Heldeberg neighborhood. I'm going to put his information in the chat, email and phone. Um, you should always reach out to him if you have concerns about anything happening in your neighborhood, unless, of course, it's an emergency. I um, just wanted to say hello and welcome to the other officers on the call tonight, and I'll give the floor to Gordy. Thank you. Where did he go? <laughs> Maybe I have to unmute him. Hold on. There he is. Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. So it's been, um, uh, Hillary asked me to go back and pull the numbers going back to like mid-December, which I did. And um, there's uh, about 300 calls for service, total calls for service throughout the whole uh, neighborhood over that time. Um, that might sound like a high number, but in reality, uh, 140 of those calls uh, went between St. Peter's and Parsons and a couple of the other group homes. Um, so we can 
kind of omit those from any of our neighborhood issues. Um, and of the part one, part two crimes that we go over every month, um, uh, murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglaries, larcenies, motor vehicle larcenies, um, assaults, criminal mischiefs, uh, weapons charges or weapons uh, offenses. Uh, there are only uh, 14 calls um, that came from any of those categories. Five of which, uh, five of those 14 were larcenies and four of those larcenies uh, were at the hospital at St. Peter's and two, uh, two identity theft uh, reports were taken in the neighborhood um, back uh, around Christmas time. We had one package theft uh, back on the 24th, I think, of December. So all in all, I mean, things that I think we're in pretty good shape. Things have been pretty quiet, um, stat-wise anyway. Um, of those, the other 100 and say 150 calls, uh, they're all like fire EMS calls, accidents, domestic calls, report calls, traffic stops, alarms, uh, self-initiated uh, officer activity. Um, so, so I guess, yeah, I guess I would say, you know, the past almost two months, things have been relatively quiet and I guess I'll open up to any questions. Do you have any questions for Officer McLean? You can raise your hand or um, using the feature in the reactions down at the bottom or top of your screen, or you can um, put your message in the chat. Okay. Um, Violetta, you have your hand up. I do. Hi, uh, Officer Gordy. I'm wondering, is it possible these stats for us to get them um, in a document or something so that we're able to then share that um, with membership and just kind of keep sort of a rolling tally for ourselves as well? Well, there's, I mean, the numbers I can share with you, but the actual documents I can't share. There's like sensitive. I'm thinking the there. numbers, not yeah, the document, I, but just these. Um, and then we can, you know, make sure that we, we track it for ourselves. And then we know if we keep going through the same statistics, we can start seeing trends too for ourselves. Yeah, I can, I can email you the numbers if you wanna keep track of them, I can get them to you tomorrow. That's perfect. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, I think that we do not have any additional questions for Officer McLean, but if you do have questions for him, I have put his information in the chat once again. And if you need it, need it again, you can always contact us at HNA at HNAAlbany.org. So I will turn it over to Hillary for our next speaker. And thank you again, Officer McLean. Thanks so much, Julie. Do I see a hand raise? I just want to make sure at the little bottom of my screen. Judy, Judy, are you, Judy's raising her hand. Okay, hold on. Sorry, Judy, I didn't see that. Go right ahead. You should be able to unmute. Mute. Okay. All right. Um, so I just wanted to get clarification, um, uh, Officer McLean, were the numbers that you were giving us, um, so H&A is different boundaries. Were you relying on their boundaries or were you relying on the ninth ward boundaries? Uh, is it your beat or so the, the 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 numbers that I gave you I when I give um I give the Heldeberg Neighborhood Association info to our statisticians they have it broken down by by the H and A boundary. Oh, okay, good. So um, the um, police department sends out every month to. Uh, council members, a breakdown by ward of the different kinds of crimes. And that's a routine kind of thing. I don't know how cumbersome it is, how time, what amount of time is involved. It might be just worthwhile to share like the ninth ward and the seventh ward of those sheets if it involves a lot of effort. Um, by the police department to break it down 
by neighborhood association. I'm not sure what you're asking. What, what would you like? I'm just I'm just mentioning um, with regard to when you get these figures, how how much effort goes into it to break it down by the H and A, or is it they can do it pretty much automatically? I'm pretty sure it's done automatically. They have, they have maps of the um, neighborhood, um, and that's just what they go off the boundaries. This is a uh, lieutenant. I could kind of speak to that a little bit because I'm familiar with the uh, crime analyst. So there, there's an analyst assigned uh, to just pulling data, and it's not just for the Hel Helderberg Neighbor Association. They break it down for pretty much all the neighborhood associations, and then by ward. So it's just, you know, their computer work of shifting numbers. So it doesn't. They pull all the data from the computer and then you know throw it into a report. So it's not too much work for, you know, to adjust the boundaries. But they have everything right. pretty much set up for the uh, both the wards and the uh, neighborhood associations. All right, great. All right, thanks. And we have another question came in. Um, it says, where can the public find a report of APD calls coming in? Not details, just an outline of what a typical week might look like citywide. And Amy, I unmuted you if you wanted to. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm asking kind of what uh, Judy is asking. And maybe that's a report that um, uh, Megan Keegan might get now, if it's something that the council people get. Uh, I'm just wondering how could I see that too, or um, other neighbors that might be interested in um, not relying on the news and the newspaper uh, and social media to actually know what's going on in town. As far as a weekly report? Monthly, you know, you know, something not being, you know, not trying to make it tedious, but um, I'm just kind of curious, you know, when I go to the ACPAC meetings and folks ask me what's going on, I, I don't know, unless my neighbors tell me. <clears throat> I'm wondering where where can we get that information? Well, you get it from me, you know, at the monthly meeting if we meet monthly. Um, but I guess I could uh, and I can check and see um, if that's something uh, that could be passed along to you. Uh, I don't know. If, um, well, and you're passing along no. information. Your information is very specific to the HNA neighborhood, but we all border all the other wards as well, you know. When you're out taking a walk, you're not necessarily paying attention to like, oh, I'm in the ninth ward. Oh, I'm in the seventh ward now. You know, you're in the the city of Albany, which isn't very large. So, what's happening in one ward is probably affecting the others, and certainly homeowners want to know. Amy, I'm I'm sorry that I didn't realize that you were not automatically getting that information as part of ACPAC. I would have shared it with you and since you're the ninth ward representative you really should have it for the entire ninth ward just like megan now gets it okay uh, and it is statistics that are foilable uh, there's no reason for that information to be uh, withheld so i recommend that the entire act pack ask for that information okay. to get along with the council members very good Okay, any other questions? And we can move on to our next guest, Hillary. Okay, thanks, Julie. All right, so we're so excited today to be partnering with the North for today's um, meeting. So I'd like to introduce Jennifer Plupe. Hopefully, I got your name right this time, Jennifer. Plupe. Um, Plupe. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to, you know, I think I'd get it right, but not quite. No worries. I answer to all <laughs> kinds of things. <laughs> Well, welcome, Jennifer, and thank, thank you so much for joining us. So, um, yeah, we'll let you dig in in just a moment. I just want to quickly introduce you and give everyone a little bit of background. So, sure. yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, Jennifer is an, a, a social work worker with 15 years of experience uh, working with older adults in a variety of settings. Um, and I know you've done a lot of different work around housing and working with low income communities. So. Um, and I know a lot of the work that you're doing is really trying to promote aging in place for our seniors and older adults in the community. Um, so, you know, really what we, we wanted to say to you, Jennifer, is we really appreciate you coming to speak to us tonight. We really want to be a partner. We want to help get the word out awareness to the community of what NORC is, how people can engage with NORC, both in terms of older adults as well as caretakers. Um, so I'd be, you know, ask you to, to share some of your experience on self-care as well. Um, so... Really, you know, we just, you know, 
especially with COVID, we know that there's been a lot that's had a really negative impact on some of our older adults. So I think it's really timely that you're here. And I know you've been, well, I think maybe with the organization for about a year. So, so welcome and take it away. Thank you, Hillary. I, I really do appreciate the invitation um, to speak tonight. Um, I've, I'm just going to forewarn you, I have some dogs. And if they start barking in the background, I may mute myself really quickly until they can stop. But um, so it's causing me a little anxiety that they're running amok. But um, other than that, um, I'm super excited to to be able to um, to talk a little bit about some of the services that NORC um, provides. Um, I have actually been with the agency now. Uh, it'll be a year at the end of May. So I, I can't believe it feels like yesterday, um, but also like 100 years ago. So um, yeah, I guess I'll dive right in. So, um, you know, the neighborhood naturally occurring retirement community is a, is a model um, where, you know, it's people who are, are aging in place in a specific demographic area clustered. Um, and so the, the NORC was designated, the Albany NORC at least was designated um, as a neighborhood NORC several years ago. Um, and just recently as uh, I think 2019, it was expanded, which was really exciting, which also lets us know that there is, um, you know, a growing older adult uh, population within the area. Um, and so, you know, the more we know of folks, the better we're able to serve them. Um, so we have a, we have a different, um, different disciplines on our team. Um, we are actually in the process of recruiting for a nurse, a community health nurse. We also have a case manager on our team. And then we have a director of programs that does a lot of the social um, kind of fun stuff with, with our older adults. So uh, our community health nurse really has two different um, two different roles and hats that she wears. One is around healthcare assistance, um, and so that involves providing individual healthcare consultation um, and helping residents manage chronic health conditions, understanding diagnoses, um, helping to monitor medication adherence, um, and also helps residents access and navigate the healthcare system, which can be pretty daunting for some folks. Um, this person also engages residents in the assessment and care planning process and also helps with arranging and coordinating services and provides follow up and monitoring um, as uh, appropriate. Um, one thing that I think it's always important to remind folks is that our services are free and voluntary. So, you know, you know, just because somebody lives in the NORC um, doesn't necessarily mean they want to engage with uh, NORC services and that's okay. We're here for the long haul. And as people continue to age in place, we wanna be able to um, you know, meet, with, meet them where they are, relationship build. So as, as they continue to age, they're more apt to wanna reach out to us um, and, and explore whatever services and supports might be available to them. Um, so that was a little sidebar, but uh, our uh, community health nurse also helps um, by conducting regular health and wellness programs um, and coordinates and conducts um, services like blood pressure screening clinics and vaccine clinics. Um, the second hat that she, he or she wears is um, supporting residents by providing the person-centered um, health-based support and care coordination um, and um, helps residents engage in a variety of health education opportunities and engages in outreach activities designed to identify folks who um, have immediate or ongoing medical um, or healthcare needs. Uh, so we're really an interdisciplinary team. And so we oftentimes, um, a nurse may go out, provide a warm referral to our um, case manager because there's, that person may see that there's much more there than just um, nursing services that might be needed. So um, it's a really nice symbiotic relationship we have within the team. Um, we also provide um, different types of, of exercise programs. Um, uh, we have uh, a former nurse of ours, Judy England, who does chair yoga for us. It's a very well um, attended uh, class. She's got a big following um, and she's currently doing that on Zoom and has been uh, since the pandemic hit. Um, and we also have, so that is happening twice a month. And then we have contracted with an in-person yoga teacher who is um, doing kind of all levels yoga, which is exciting. Um, and then we have um, our programming uh, person, Marla, who also helps um, with some of the exercise piece as far as, you know, scheduling nature walks, um, getting people out of the house, um, engaged back into nature. Specifically, we try to 
we schedule those towards the nicer um, weather uh, months. So we're looking at doing our first in-person walk um, as a group in April. Um, so Marla uh, also does a lot of work with organizing social addings and trips, cultural events and educational programs. Um, and then we just re I just hired a case manager who started at the very beginning of um, January, Ann Hill, who happens to live in the Newark, and which is just a wonderful um, pairing because she has a you know deep commitment to the community is really well versed um, with the service area and um, you know just has a real passion to give back to her community so it's a win-win for both for all parties so Anne's role is really in the advocacy information and referral um, services she does home visits she helps folks apply for services support um, care coordination helps people if they um, need to apply for benefits assistance and also helps with, with a whole variety of other types of paperwork. Um, so that's kind of like, th those are our core services. Um, and so I know Hillary, you had asked, you know, how, how would somebody refer somebody for services? So, you know, we do a variety of different outreach um, activities um, using a variety of different modalities. Um, so we do some friendly visiting. Um, we do a lot of telephone reassurance, especially since the pandemic hit. We have a large email blast that goes out through constant contact, um, keep, keeping people informed and reminded of Newark services, programming, events. Um, we also send out a ton of newsletters to um, over a thousand people, um, really, um, highlighting uh, the services and supports. Uh, the latest newsletter covers both March and the month of March and April. So it's got a nice snapshot of what's coming up in the next coming months so that people can really prepare um, and, and kind of pick and choose what might be of interest to them. We also started um, recently, I think in December, um, in between the newsletter months, sending out a postcard. So a real nice like kind of cool looking postcard that people can put on the refrigerator. That's a nice snapshot of all the different programs that are happening. Because what we find is, is that people get the newsletter, they'll, you know, flip through it, they'll, they'll mark it up and then they'll, it'll get lost or it'll get tossed in the recycling. And they're like, shoot, I wish I would have, you know, uh, put that somewhere else. And so uh, that's where the, um, the postcard idea was born from. Um, so, and then we also do, you know, unfortunately, I haven't been with the agency pre-pandemic, so my my basis of knowledge is is really in the midst of a pandemic. But from what I understand, our programming brings, especially when we are doing it in person, it brings a lot of people to the table. And part of how we do outreach is a lot of word of mouth, right? We get people who come to these programs and are like, hey, I've got a neighbor down the street, Betty, who I think could use some services. I'm really worried about her. She doesn't seem to be um, you know, things seem to have changed for her and, you know, I'm concerned about her. Um, and then, so that's kind of what we do right now. And looking into the future a little bit, um, I'm working with an intern to help work on a survey and a needs assessment to send out to, to the entire North community. I think it's been quite a while since that's happened. Um, so what I always tell people is if you know of an older adult who may need assistance, give us a call. Um, but before you do, see if you can get that person's permission or blessing to speak to us or to share their phone number so we can reach out. Um, we, we will not just go and knock on somebody's door unless, we, unless they know we're coming. Um, we really respect people's right to privacy and autonomy. And just because someone lives in the North Catchment area doesn't mean they want to engage with us um, or attend programming. But we do want to be able to keep an eye on those most vulnerable and we have to be creative and delicate in our out, outreach efforts. Um, it, helps to redu um, it helps to reduce concern around uh, privacy issues when we really are careful to respect people's um, autonomy. Um, the work we do is considered long-term work and the relationship building process is, is a major key factor in being able to provide um, services and supports as needed. So we start, you know, start interacting with people when they're in their 60s 70s, maybe as they age into 80s, their needs have changed. They already know who we are. We've developed that relationship. They trust us. They know who we are, and they're much more apt to want to take advantage of some of the services and supports that um, that we have. Um, so that's kind of our our outreach in a nutshell. On top of um, you know 
attending some of these uh, neighborhood association meetings, I think is really key. Um, and I'm really happy I've been able to um, be able to do that tonight. So um, I know Hillary, you had talked about, you know, maybe touching a little bit on COVID impact um, to our older adult population. And, you know, it has, nobody has, has gone unscathed from, from what has happened with COVID over the past uh, couple of years. I don't think anybody thought it would go on as long as it has. Um, so what we saw in the first year of the pandemic um, was a lot of helping folks obtain household supplies, necessities, food, accessing healthcare, and transportation as a major need. Um, once we were able to assist with managing some of these critical needs, we then started to focus on how to stay engaged with members of the NORC. So there was lots of Zoom programming and all kinds of outreach calls that happened at that point. Um, the ongoing COVID crisis has had a variety of impacts on our adult population. Um, the most prevalent is the impact of social isolation, um, in particular impact to people's mental, physical health. Um, so what we are seeing are people are putting off getting their medical care. Um, there's intense feelings of loneliness, intense fear of the unknown, um, impact around grief and loss um, of loved ones to COVID, um, sometimes multiple losses in the same family, um, disenfranchised grief for the loss of freedom and autonomy, particularly with those folks who have retired right before the pandemic, you know, never really thinking that they were gonna spend the first two years of their retirement in this type of a situation. Um, we see oftentimes um, some cognitive changes, this type of stress long-term can um, really impact people's cognition. And so what we're seeing is, you know, some memory impairment, some confusion, and an increased risk of falls um, due to deconditioning because of lack of regular exercise. Um, we have seen a marked increase in alcohol use, binge drinking, use and misuse of prescription medications for depression, anxiety, and sleep. Um, and um, not this doesn't, I don't want to alarm anybody. This hasn't happened, at least in my, uh, in my knowledge in the North, but nationwide, there's been a massive uptick in the suicide rates. Um, and there has also been an, in, uh, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, an increase in older adult abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Because what was happening was everybody was sheltering in place, and there was less eyes on some of these um, vulnerable adults. And so what we were seeing was um, around stimulus monies. There was a lot of pilfering of, of older adults, stimulus checks, and things like that. Um, so financial uh, abuse uh, is got ramped up uh, because of COVID and the lack of, of eyes on folks on a regular basis. Um, you couple that with the closure of adult days, senior centers, and congregate meal sites. These have all contributed to symptoms and have caused our older adults to feel disconnected from their communities. Um, not being able to visit children, grandchildren, or family members, and family, um, that was early in the pandemic, but it certainly did linger um, for some time after getting fully vaccinated to considerable amount of fear of contracting or transmitting the virus, even when folks have been vaccinated. Um, and of course the news of variants really tends to kind of cause people to, to kind of spin back into that intense sense of fear. And then you add the political polarization of the pandemic and vaccine um, treatments, and that just makes the perfect storm for all kinds of confusion um, and fear. Um, so even though we were able to do a lot of things via Zoom, um, access and use of technology was a barrier to socialization and a sense of connectedness for some of our folks. Some people, don't want a computer, don't use a computer, don't want to know how to use a computer. Um, and then some people just, just became overwhelmed. Then we have the other piece where people now are pretty burned out on Zoom um, and really are looking for that in-person um, interaction. Um, so that's what we're really looking to do is, is to get a more in-person programming and services as long as the virus transmission rate uh, stays on the decline. Um, so we're kind of, to use that term, opening the spigot a little bit. So we're, we're gonna be doing more and more, in per, or scheduling more and more in-person programming as we kind of get into the nicer months. So um, caregivers of, of older adults um, are facing almost identical um, 
issues uh, with, with the protracted nature of the pandemic. Um, many overlapping with challenges faced for, by our older adults, but with comp, but with are complicated because of the caregiving responsibility and role. So we're seeing caregivers neglecting their own physical and mental health. Um, same, de uh, delaying medical appointments and routine visits, not going to preventative care treatment appointments, um, and a decline in social activity and interactions with other has really um, made the caregiving role even that much more um, difficult. Um, mental health concerns and needs are strongest among um, caregivers of older adults who, and some of these folks are reporting extreme exhaustion and emotional, physical, and financial stress. You couple that with the lack of respite care and home care services due to the caregiver shortage, and it's another perfect storm for really negative health outcomes. Um, the negative impact of COVID-19 on caregivers' mental health include fear, anxiety, frustration, depression, um, again, market increase in alcohol use, uh, prescriptions, um, same as what I had mentioned with our older adults. Um, so there are some services out there available for caregivers of older adults. However, they're not as um, readily available as I would like to see. Um, I did share with Hillary in preparation for this meeting, there's actually a powerful tools for caregiver um, program. It's a six week series that is starting um, actually today. Um, and it's a really, it's a really great um, evidence-based program. And so um, that's available. It, I think those series run a few times a year. So um, really encourage folks to, to take advantage of that if you have an opportunity or come across that. Um, our case manager can help discuss uh, specific caregiving needs and to help connect uh, those with caregiver burnout to services within the area. We're actually, um, the NORC and JFS are looking to develop our own internal caregiving support services, which is right now at its infancy stage. Um, but we know there's a great need out there and we wanna help to meet those needs. So we're in the process of uh, grant writing and trying to kind of get our ducks in a row um, to, to launch that um, you know, later this year. Uh, the, and then the Alzheimer's Association has resources and groups for to support caregivers of those with Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, and so that sort of brings us into like, how do we manage all of this, right? Like myself, I'm sure you all are older adults, caregivers, um, it's all about self-care. And so what does that look like? And what does it mean? And it's not magic. It's not hokey. It's, it's really rather simple if people will take the time and acknowledge the level of stress that they're under and really take the time to prioritize your own needs so that you can then, you know, be of service to somebody else. So prioritizing sleep, practicing good sleep hygiene, making sure you're going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time as best as possible. No phone or TV for at least 30 minutes before you go to bed, making sure you're getting good exercise, making sure you're eating healthy foods, um, avoiding or limiting alcohol and caffeine. Uh, caffeine's a stimulant and alcohol is a depressant. It'll only make you feel worse, both mentally and physically. Um, it might make you feel good for the first 15 minutes you're doing it, but afterwards it's, it's no good. Um, make sure you're taking your vitamins in particular um, all year round, especially up north, vitamin D, um, particularly your vitamin D3, um, really does help with mood um, and also has, um, you know, the bone um, density and uh, calcium absorption piece. Um, limit time on your computer and social media. It can be super overwhelming to see a lot of negativity or, or all kinds of things um, that you might come across that you don't even want to. Um, make sure you're listening, you know, if you enjoy listening to music, make, you know, listen to your favorite songs, dance. It, I mean, it sounds silly, but it gets those endorphins going. Um, and uh, allow yourself to experience a little bit of joy. Um, again, exercise to get those feel good endorphins, walk, run, practice yoga, meditation, play with your grandkids, remember what it's like to be a kid. Um, I find engaging with kids just like totally reinfuses um, my energy. Um, engage in a healthy hobby, crafting, knitting, photography, make sure you're getting fresh air every day. And when you're outside, don't forget to look up. So many people are spend their days just on their phones or staring at the ground or not, you know, not taking in the, what's going on around them. 
limit watching the news, take a news break. Um, unfortunately, we see much more negativity than we see positive things. And we know that there's just as much positive out there, it's just not covered as much. So it's skewed and it can really get to people mentally. If you enjoy reading, read. If you have a, if, if you have a favorite movie, put it on. Um, and then helping others. Givers receive in many ways, uh, givers receive in many ways, but they don't under, but never underestimate the benefit of giving, right? Um, it, it really helps to um, reinfuse us as well. Um, and then, you know, try to have moments or longer where you're staying present and grounded, um, aware of how you feel instead of distracting yourself and, and looking for ways to kind of numb out or, or get away from those feelings. I can't stress enough the importance of breathing and breathing properly. It's, it's amazing. I've actually, I was never one of these people that liked to go through these breathing exercises. I felt weird doing it, but I've practiced this a lot during the pandemic and taking a little bit of time every day, taking in slow, intentional breaths in through your nose for four seconds, hold it for four seconds and exhale slowly through your mouth for four seconds. Actually, you can feel your body relax. You do that maybe four or five times in a row, slowly, so you hyperventilate, um, and you should really start to feel a sense of relaxation. Um, the other piece is setting boundaries for yourself. You know, it's okay to say no. You can't give what you don't have, and you have to work to recharge your own battery before you can help anybody else. You know, talk to someone you trust how, uh, about how you're feeling, or you know, there's there's a lot of therapists and professionals out there. Um, if you don't want to talk to somebody that's in, in your your close circle, um, you'd be surprised to know that you're not alone. Um, and oftentimes, people really think that they're in their stuff themselves. They're in their stuff by themselves, um, and and oftentimes, knowing that you're not alone actually makes all the difference. And then, you know, joining an online or in-person support group, never underestimate the power of group work. It's a pretty powerful dynamic when, it, when it's run well and facilitated well. Um, and so these are just some of, the, um, some of the suggestions that I have for practicing really good self-care. That's what I got. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you. That was a really fantastic overview of the NORC. I mean, we are such an incredibly fortunate community to have, you know, you and your team and services here. And the COVID impacts are even more dire than I was expecting to hear. And I think the self-care is something everybody really needs to hear, no matter how often you have or haven't heard it. So sincere, thank you very much. Of course. So, um, <laughs> yeah. We do have some questions coming in. So um, the first question is, is there any plan to ex extend the boundaries of the NORC? Um, not that I'm aware yet uh, in Albany, um, but I, you know, uh, I had heard some mutterings that there may be um, additional NORCs within the state that are designated. Um, but as far as our, our NORC boundary and catchment area, I haven't heard anything about that yet. Got you. Thank you. Julie, did you want to Hillary, jump in? Hillary, can I just jump in there? I just want to make sure people are aware that about two years ago, the boundaries had been expanded. So over to yep. like Western Avenue, et cetera. Yep, right so. up to 85. Great. Um, Jennifer, thank you. That was an excellent overview of the NORC. I have a strong interest in aging issues. Um, I just had a couple questions just for just make sure I understand who's eligible for the services at the NORC. And, and um, off the top of your head, I'm not asking you for exact statistic, but um, how much, how many of your members are Medicaid eligible people? And do you is it is everything everything's free right i just want to make sure everyone understands that everything's free everything's available to anyone who applies regardless of income correct correct so free and voluntary that's what i like to say um okay. just to kind of keep reminding folks especially um around you know well both the free and voluntary right we okay. don't we're not gonna we're not gonna force anybody to to be in the pro in the program or part of the of part of the program, but we are here for anybody. And as far as the Medicaid question, I would say, like just from what I've seen since I've been in the in the role, it's it's a very small percentage. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that there, you know, there's people out there that we haven't 
made contact with or outreach to that are. Um, but at least in my experience with almost the last year I've worked here, it's and coming from work where I've worked with low income population, uh, you know, lower socioeconomic economic status um, and in senior housing where the lion's share of my work was that, um, that is not what I'm seeing now. Okay, thank you. And just one last question. Um, how closely does the NORC work with the, the um, State Office for Aging in the area, um, the AAAs, the area agencies on aging? Like how do um, you coordinate with them for services? Uh, Pretty regularly, actually, okay. you know, we, you know, for Meals on Wheels, uh, for mm -hmm. uh, farmer's market coupons, um, that's, that's like a, that's a big annual right around, I think, June. Um, but we're in regular contact. And then, of course, New York, uh, NYSOFA is the one who um, hold, basically holds our contract and our grant uh, for services. Okay. That was, that was my final question. How are you? Yep. I thought you just answered that. So yeah. thank you. I'm just going to put in the chat for everyone, um, if you did want to contact the local area um, agencies on aging, it's also, in addition to NORC, a good place to go if you need services. So I'm going to put that in the chat. Thank you, Jennifer. Of course. So I just want to just clarify, sorry, on the on the funding piece. So uh, NYSOFA, we get 75% of our funding from NYSOFA with the understanding that there's uh, a or we get 100% of funding from NYSOFA with the understanding that the JFS has to kick in a 25% match. So the administrating agency, the umbrella agency, um, has, has an obligation of a 25% match. Jennifer, I was curious to know um, how, when expanding, what are you really looking for? What is the criteria that looks into expansion in a certain area? So I know you've gone, you know, you go to West, you've gone to Western as far as the 85, but what about the other direction? You know, um, what what is the criteria that helps uh, drive those decisions? I think I, in sort of digging through the archives when I first started and trying to get my bearings um, in my position, I think that there, there was, um, I think some of it's based on census data. And I think that some of it is also um, through like a, a windshield survey or community needs assessment. Mm -hmm. um, but really what it, what it is, is there needs to be a certain percentage of people 16 over living within a, you know, kind of uh, clustered in the same area. Um, and that's what, helps to designate a NORC. In the city, you know, those NORCs are, are um, vertical NORCs, right? Because everybody lives kind of vertically in New York City. So mm -hmm. there's a ton of them there. Um, here, the interesting thing that I learned and in, in starting my work is that any building that was built specifically for seniors, um, that is also supposed to have services and supports built in, whether it's tax credit properties, HUD subsidized, they're not, uh, they're not allowed to be part of the NORC because it's considered a duplication of services at that point. Mm -hmm. And those buildings were built specifically for seniors. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering again, um, does that mean, you, are we going to see maybe a, a changing of the boundaries given the new census, do you think? Uh, yeah, I don't think so because I think okay. at least I we expanded in 2019. So I would say it's going to take a little bit more time to kind of do another kind of uh, assessment of the area and to see how many people are continuing to age in place, how many new people have moved in. You know, people are selling homes. Um, you know, are, are, do we still have the same ratio mm -hmm. or po of population in the area? Got it. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, and Leo, let me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow with the unmute button. If, if anybody on our board can unmute Leo, please. I, I think I'm unmuted. Beautiful. Uh, yep, we hear you. I, so, it, just following up on the last few questions, I, I'm wondering, are you getting inquiries about NORC services from people outside who live outside the north boundaries and if so how do you deal with that it's a you know it's a it's a tricky conversation right because you know we don't want to be we don't want to exclude folks from from our services but contractually we we have to 
you know, we're bound to the to the contract, the terms of the contract. So what we do is, you know, when we can, we refer them internally to the JFS arm of the agency for services and supports because, you know, JFS also has a whole um, uh, variety of services that they offer. Um, or we try to put them in touch with um, other community service providers that may be able to help meet their needs. Now, we are allowed per the contract to do these kind of one time events a few times a year where it's not um, exclusive to NORC. So we can, you know, oftentimes we get people from, you know, Whitehall Court, St. Sophia's, Holy Wisdom, Ohaf Shalom Apartments that all, you know, come and join us. Um, but when we're counting our numbers for our targets for our core services, we can't count those folks. But it doesn't matter because those are one time events and we're allowed. Um, per the contract to be able to do that. Um, but we've had to have tough conversations with people around that. Um, it's, you know, bound, it's trying to, trying to let people know um, and educate them uh, about the contract without going into the weeds, um, but also letting them know that if, even though we might not be able to provide certain services and supports, we're not gonna just say, oh, sorry, um, we're gonna make sure that we connect them um, as best as we can. Thank you. All right, and Megan, go jump right in. We yeah, I just I was just gonna jump in to say that you know since taking over my role in the council, I did have an issue uh, involving aging issues for somebody who turned out lived outside the NORC, but in my you know sort of quest to assist them with Marla, she did get them connected pretty much immediately with a Jewish Family Services case coordinator who then helped them deal with kind of this emergent situation in which they were going to be without um, any supervisory care for somebody who required um, constant um, support in the home. So um, they, if you were to reach out to them and they don't cover you, they would definitely point you in the right direction of, of where to go um, in terms of finding that assistance in the community. So they can still be a resource to that end. That's all. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Megan. And listen, Jennifer, this has been terrific. I think this is a topic clearly there's a lot of engagement around. So we sincerely thank you and we look forward to continue collaborating and partnering. Um, we'll be talking about the post office in just a minute. We know we'll see you in the morning there. That's right. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say a sincere thank you very much. And if folks have other questions, please send them along and we'll make sure to put you in touch with Jennifer and her team. All right, thank you again, Jennifer. I think, are we all set? And did you have any final remarks you want to share? No, just very happy to have been part of this meeting. And, you know, if there's any time, if there's a topic down the road that you kind of want, think you it would be helpful to have covered as it relates to kind of, you know, aging services, let me know, because I'm happy to, to explore that with you. That's great. Thank you very much. Jennifer, I would, um, for future, and I'll talk to the board about this, I would love to hear more about some health equity issues in, um, in terms of access for persons of color in the neighborhood in the NORC and whether you have stats on them and how the outreach looks and things like that. So we'll discuss in the future. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right, Violetta, H&A updates. Yes. So let me just... Uh... Sorry, I'm just going to take a look at the agenda. So yes, we. Um, so I'm pretty sure most of you took a look at our survey. You did get that, and I just want to share the responses with you. Um, I know moving to Thursday was a change from our traditional Wednesday, but clearly when we did survey members, we uh, we received 36 response, which we were very happy with, um, and. What you'll see, it was really the Thursday evening here was a clear winner and the time as well, this came out clearly out on top too. So wanted to share that. Um, and we really decided to ask our members their opinion because we really wanna know how to best serve you. So you'll see moving forward, probably us reaching out with those type of surveys when we have other questions for you as well. This year at our last board meeting, we just wanted uh, to share with you that 
we as a board really wanted to take on some of the administrative things that um, we really wanted to make sure were rock solid so that we could really leave a strong and sustainable uh, neighborhood association. And to that endeavor, one of the things that we're looking at is definitely providing a website that's a little bit more user friendly um, and will have information that our members can access. Um, we will do that. You probably noticed some of our communications have been a little bit updated. So just doing that um, really so that we can enlarge our audience. Um, I know that many of you um, hear our information and part of what you'll see uh, on that survey was how people hear about our news. And really that was from email. So, which is fantastic. But so that also means we need to grow that list, grow our membership um, so that we can really better serve the entire community. Um, so those are some of the things we are looking at. Part of that as well is reviewing all of our bylaws. Are they current? Do they still make sense? So moving forward in this year, you might see that there might be some changes that we'll ask our members to vote on. So this is some of the activities that we're planning and looking at, and certainly where we want your input. We really want to have an engaging, uh, have engaging meetings, um, and this is just sort of a, a start. We are looking forward to having in-person events. We're very excited to be planning things. Um, the picnic, the movie night. Um, we will also, um, hopefully, depending on how things go, moving away from Zoom meetings, but this is also something that we'll pro you'll see us ask you about. So there'll be a lot of asking our members what you want, right? Because um, we really here as a community uh, that are here to serve you as well. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been talking, we want to share. Also, um, when I talk about some of the events and the programming that we have, mo all of our funding really is just with our dues. And so one of the things we'll be taking a look at, if we wanna grow our programming, do we have to potentially you know, increase um, our, our dues? Are we also looking at sponsorships from different businesses and nonprofits or different groups? Uh, donations, of course, are always welcome and something that really helps us um, put on the programming that we have. Um, so we do have a lot of very supportive community members and businesses, but anything that we can then do to grow um, our programming will take the effort of, of all of us here. So we're excited about the new year and some of the things that um, we really want to get um, in place so that we can really leapfrog to some very great things. So let me know folks uh, in the board if I missed anything. Um, but otherwise, um, I think we can, oh, we did want to talk about our treasurer report. He could not make it. Um, so the exact figures um, we will share in the meeting minutes, but we can tell you that there really has not been expenses uh, since our last meeting. So those numbers have not changed, but the exact figures will be sent to you and in our meeting minutes. Hillary, back to you. Thanks, Nioletta. I think the only thing to add on to that is we have a really fabulous board who, uh, you know, we have a couple of new folks on the board who have really added tremendous value to the team. Um, and so you're going to be seeing, I think, a lot of um, really commitment to engaging our community. And so I'm just really thrilled about it. I just want to say thank you to our board. Um, so the next thing we wanted to share some updates on were the post office. So I know a lot of you have been paying attention to what's going on. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going into the background, but just to quickly make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, we're very concerned that our Academy Station Post Office uh, may be closing. Um, we've been working on this issue for over a year now. Quick history, if this is new to you, the post office was previously located at 563 New Scotland Avenue. That site is now being redeveloped. Um, construction, excuse me, demolition began August, September timeframe. Um, and while it's not widely known to, among the public, the post office did temporarily relocate to 363 Ontario Street. And they opened that location about mid-November. 
Um, there's been very little to no communication from USPS about this new facility unless you're a PO box holder. Um, and we recently learned that the lease is set to expire at the end of this month. That's the, what we learned from the property owner. Um, so our, you know, our original advocacy was to keep the post office at 563 New Scotland. Um, we were very committed to that. We uh, thank you know, our outgoing council members, Doshe and Fahey for a tremendous amount of work there, including a notable um, city council resolution trying to get USPS to commit to that location. They did not, so we pivoted. We pivoted to support 363 Ontario Street. It's an accessible site. Um, USPS spent a lot of money renovating it. So we're in the, you know, we're now launched a multi-neighborhood association coalition. Again, working very closely uh, with our council members, council member Keegan, council member Adams have been hugely supportive and, and huge advocates along with honestly our entire slate of federal, state and local representatives were incredibly lucky. So um, h and has been partnering with Pine Hills Neighborhood Association, Park South and the Delaware Area Neighborhood Associations as well as Cana and its multi-organizational uh, effort to really do everything we can to save Academy Station. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat, you know, a couple of actions I want to highlight that we've been focused on. So in the chat, I just put the link to our petition. We've gotten over 500 signatures, which is exciting. We want to double, triple, quadruple that so we could use your help getting the word out. Um, our asks are really simple. We're asking USPS to ensure that um, they don't close down the post office until they have a plan in place, even a short term plan. To, to keep you know to keep the post office open until they know where the long term location will be. Our second ask is to let people know um, that it's open and we're doing everything we can to get out the word and to request USPS to do the same. And then the third is that we are asking them to keep the post office in our community in the long run. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do. There is a media event that will take place tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock at the post office. We have um, a large lineup of our elected officials from Congressman Tonko, Mayor Sheehan, Executive County Executive McCoy, our very own council members, Megan Keegan, Sergio Adams, our county legislators, et cetera. Um, so that'll be another way to, to garner attention. We've also um, put together a sign-on letter for our elected officials. The entire, almost the entire Albany Common Council has signed our Albany County legislatures. Again, all of our elected officials have been incredibly supportive. Um, very fortunate for that leadership. So that's really what we're engaged in. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. We've been trying to be as transparent as possible. Um, I do wanna let everybody know Congressman Tonko has really been our liaison with the USPS. We've been posing questions to the Congressman. He he actually got a meeting together with the, the USPS leadership um, this summer. And so they've been incredibly helpful in trying to get information from USPS. Transparency has been a challenge. Um, and actually uh, the house just passed a postal service reform bill. So there is a lot of effort going on. Uh, Senator Gillibrand has also been a huge advocate and been supportive of our efforts. Um, and, and she's been doing a lot around the post office as well, especially for banking issues. So. Um, we have a lot of engagement on this, but enough for me. If anybody has any questions, concerns, comments, we'd be happy to take them. And uh, at the risk, you know, Zoom security, we're trying to balance it all, but to make it easier for folks, we did uh, just the setting. So if people have questions or comments, you don't need us to unmute you anymore. You can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Any questions, comments, concerns from anyone on the post office? I'd like to make a comment. I just want to thank you so much, Hillary. I mean, you have worked endless hours on this uh, strategizing and and for the board, uh, you know, engaging the board on this and having numerous conversations. And it's just um, very disappointing that we have to beg, you know, for this, considering the city lost three post offices about 10 years ago, eight years ago. Um, and, um, you know, I really appreciate your 
picking up the mantle and, um, you know, you're a volunteer and um, uh, this is a, you know, great thing for the Neighborhood Association to be doing. Um, and I really appreciate your work and your leadership on it. Thanks, Judy. I, I really appreciate that. And we have an incredible team. I mean, the one really positive thing about this is our community has truly come together. Our board, this multi-neighborhood association group, our, our outgoing elected officials are incoming. I mean, it's been a truly incredible partnership. So it's been as discouraging as the U.S. Postal Service has been. It's been equally encouraging how engaged and committed and, and focused on things like equity our community is. So it's been very encouraging. So thank you. All right, um, any, other, any other questions, comments, concerns on the post office? Okay. I did just wanna to note to you guys, I, I am incredibly sorry that I am gonna miss the press conference tomorrow um, due to my unfortunate work schedule that I cannot rearrange, um, but, but I am in full support um, and I did um, provide uh, the neighborhood associations with a direct quote for the press conference tomorrow. Um, and, you know, certainly will continue to lend my support and whatever you guys need me to do, I will do. Um, I have also been every day, which is important for folks to know, Google right now still marks uh, the Ontario location as temporarily closed. Mm -hmm. And I do log on to Google every single day and require and ask them to edit it to know that it is open. So um, anybody else want to join me in that effort? Maybe if Google sees more than just myself, like putting that in, they'll finally fix it. Who knows? Where do you put that? How do you get in touch with them? So when you open up, when you when you Google the post office on Ontario and it says, um, yeah, I've seen temporarily that. closed, there's a button right underneath that that says, do you want to suggest an edit or suggest an edit? And you click on that and it will bring you to a new menu that allow like a drop down menu that allows you to mark it as open. Okay. All so right. and I, I you, am aware there's no way to like call Google and be like, hey, you guys messed up. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's Google's fault. USPS is aware of this and they've decided not to do anything about it. We alerted Congressman Tonko and he's requested that they fix it. I, I don't think it's Google. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but that's great, Megan. Well, Thank it's you. it's listed as open on USPS's website, so I don't. So maybe it is like, Google's problem. Yeah, like it's. I don't. Mm, I don't know yeah. what the algorithm problem is in there, but USPS has it listed as open at that location. It's the actual. I mean, who's going to actually bother to go click when Google Maps marks it as closed? Um, yeah. Do you do this during the business day? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not you're doing it at midnight. I mean, oh, yeah, no, oh, I'm doing it like right. around 9, 30, 10 o'clock every morning. Okay, all right. Um, and we can all do it as soon as we get off this call. Every one of us get on and do it. I know. Um, like my, my favorite new start to my work day is <laughs> checking Google to see if the post office is open or closed. <laughs> um, whose lease is up at the end of the month? United States Postal Service. To to the Park Avenue location? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So they built this new post office, renovated, and then gave them what, a four month lease? It was a, it was a temporary emergency funding. I don't know the, the terms oh, of the lease, okay. but it was a short lease. They have their their rationale was that the location is not in the best location for their service for their customers. But they didn't share what the criteria was for that uh, for the cost, Well, it might be the bet not the best location for people who are coming in with trucks full of boxes to mail, but it is a good location for people who are going as walking or in their car. It, but, they're not transparent in sharing why. Right. Is the bottom line. I, you know, we can speculate, but they have not shared that reasoning with us. And if the a property owner hadn't shared that the lease was ending, we wouldn't have known it. That came from the property owner. So okay. the lack of transparency has been frustrating and challenging. But, on the postal um, service side. On the postal service side. 
but Congressman Tonko has done a wonderful job of um, channel, you know, funneling our questions and and now passing this this act. You know, at least Congress has passed the the, the act, which trans transparency is a major piece of you know within that legislation. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Hillary, I, you know, it's been great conversation and tomorrow the event is going to be great. It's so wonderful that so many people um, are coming out for that. And again, thank you for all your efforts. But just for uh, timing, thank um, you, we have about Peter. 15 minutes left. So we do want to give our elected um, time. To, thank yeah. You, yeah, you're welcome. So um, how about... I know there's an agenda. I just don't have it up right now. Who do we have first? I think Liz. Danielle's introducing. Yeah. The, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, um, no okay. problem. No problem. Da Danielle here. I'm going to introduce our elected officials. Um, first up is uh, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Lakakis, Albany County legislator. She may or may not be your district <laughs> representative. Well, I actually think that uh, except for Leo and the uh, police officers, I believe I am your county legislators based on where you're living. And I do know most of you, so I'm sure you're my county legislator. You know, my district is a half of Helderberg and half of Delaware. So, um, you know, I when you talk about the post office, I always get a little traumatized because I was involved, you know, 10 years ago with uh, Louise McNeely and Susan Du Bois and the merry band of Joyce Keenan and we you know really tried to get our post office to stay and so I'm hoping that uh, we are successful with the Ontario Street one because it is it's very it's been very difficult for our neighborhood over here you know not to have a place to be able to walk to 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 you know and we don't have that many tangible stories to share but it's just it's just another service that we lost on the avenue and uh, you know it's, it's hard to deal with, as you know. So let's hope we don't have to lose another one. Everybody get out there and do your Google thing to, to this evening. And uh, what did I want to tell you today? Uh, we announced this morning, I think it was, uh, that we put $50,000 uh, and we have a, a partnership between Albany Law School and the U.S. Uh, Committee on um, refugees and immigrants, um, and they're going to be helping Afghan refugees with uh, legal resources and helping people to get connected. And that was uh, something that we were excited to do. We had some money that we put aside during the budget process for some extra services that we just identified amongst ourselves that, anyway, that was one of them. Uh, I've been working on, uh, I've been on the personnel committee pretty much since I started, and we've been working on the rules and regulations, which you might also have noticed in the paper this week. We um, were putting in a first pass, uh, and mostly it's about the time and attendance problems that we've had. We've had a couple of suits that we had to settle, and we've had uh, identified by uh, Mike Connors and Susan Rizzo. We had asked her to also review the, um, the timekeeping uh, problems when we first were, they brought to our attention. So anyway, uh, this we're doing, I don't know, it's like 16 bits of information to make the timekeeping a little more transparent and clear and you know who's supposed to do what and the chain of command and you know you can't clock yourself in it's pretty uh, average stuff but it needed to be codified because the practices weren't always lining up uh, across all the departments so that's what something we've been working on i just was given a new committee this uh past month uh the rules and regulations and modernization committee and it was uh came upon after a task force that i had worked on a couple of years ago about modernizing and you know we did get a computer program and got into the 21st century and now we're going to try to take it a little bit further because that program is not really as <clears throat> transparent to you as it ought to be by now by now you ought to be able to go to the website and just click on granicus and be able to say find out anything you want to find out no foil know anything, but it's not all the way there yet. So we're going to be working on that and going through some other rules uh, of our own to make sure that we're doing things fairly and uh, openly and adequately. What else do I want to tell you? I've been working a long while on the Board of Elections Task Force and we, um, you know, task forces and committees, they're not the same. So I, it's not got a lot of credence and, you know, but it's something we've been working on to try to work on that um, We'll call it a plaza where the Board of Elections is, the mental health and the health department down there on Pearl across from the mission. 
we've also been reading about that in the paper and how challenging that a lot of that is. But we did convince, uh, we convinced the uh, staff uh, for the executive to, you know, he has engaged a, uh, I think it's a CS architecture to kind of look at that plaza and engage with the, not only the people who work here, but other community members to see how, what physical changes they can make to that plaza that would, uh, you know, make it seem a little more important than it is and have people not napping in the parking lot and doing other things that people have been doing in the parking lot. So uh, maybe a little more secure, um, a little more inviting, a little more uh, comfortable for everybody who has to go and vote there and wants to go and vote there and make it a little more appealing because we're doing uh, this mostly because we would like more people to vote and we understand that it is uh, not as inviting as, and also there's been some crime there and other things. So we've been working on that for some time and that's coming to fruition. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say today. Um, I know you're, I, did, I am going first, which is exciting and I thank you for that. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, my name, if you can spell it, you can email me. And my phone uh, is uh, 248-6292 uh, if you want to text me or uh, contact me in any way. And all the information is on the county website. If And we also have a county Facebook where they, you know, put, like they put that little announcement today. It was online, live, very exciting. Oh, and thank you all who, who participated in the uh, Martin Luther King food drive a couple weeks ago. It was, uh, we raised a bit of money and, you know, not as much food, but we did raise a bit of money. So uh, we were able to distribute that and I'd like to thank you for your participation in that. Again, call me if you need me. Anyone have any questions for Lynn? Not a question, just a comment. Lynn, that's really fantastic about the Afghan refugees. That's, that's huge. Thanks. The can I just ask? Can you hear me? Um, is there much of a refugee community in the Helderberg neighborhood? Do we know? There, there is quite a bit of uh, new new Americans or folks who are um, in the process of. Um, becoming new Americans uh, that have moved in, particularly along the New Scotland corridor. Um, I believe in part because of the proximity to, I believe, is it Reese Rise, um, which is providing a lot of supports. Originally, we had seen a lot of these folks settling into Pine Hills, but we're seeing more and more of them settling um, into the New Scotland corridor area. Um, and, and most of them are, are South Asian um, folks. And there's quite a bit over in the Delaware corridor too. It's a, one of those uh, resource uh, resettlement areas. And um, you know, so between the two uh, neighborhoods, there's a decent population. I knew there was in Delaware. Uh, yeah. And I know Rise is over there on uh, West Lawrence Street, but... Uh, it might suggest that an agenda item or something for the future to. I, I think it would be great, um, perhaps to invite Rise. Um, I think it would also, if we're gonna talk about that, would be also really good to invite um, St. Vincent's because um, their parish and their food pantry, they're one of the few, there's only a certain number of food pantries that are designated in the city of Albany and they have um, one of those food pantry designations, and they are the food pantry that's working uh, most closely with most of our refugee families, at least in this area. So they, I think, also would have some really keen insights as to where those folks are going. Those are fantastic ideas. Thanks for that, both of you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lynn and Megan. Um, with that, Megan, um, would you would you like to speak next, please? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me, and I do apologize for being late. Um, Pine Hills Neighborhood Association also had their meeting this evening, so um, I worked with Hillary and with John Clarkson to kind of um, 
set up my schedule for the evening so that I could at least make an appearance at both meetings. And I, I appreciate your um, grace um, in allowing me to do that. Um, most of you, I believe, have seen my newsletter, so you should be relatively up to speed on what's been happening with the council. Um, there's a couple of things that have um, come up since my last newsletter went out in the beginning of February. First and foremost, both the Blue Collar Union and the Police Benevolent Association contracts were passed. Um, and if anybody wants to ask any specific questions on that um, or has concerns about those uh, uh, about that vote, I'm happy to take questions about that this evening. Um, and then the second um, piece that people should be aware of is that the Council Committee on Operation and Ethics has started its process of interviewing folks for reapportionment. Um, as you may or may not know, after each census, both the city and the county legislature have to redraw district lines um, based upon changes to the population in accordance with the new census data. Um, we are still short on reapportionment committee members. We were supposed to have a committee of nine and right now we only have seven applicants. So if anybody is perhaps interested um, in what that might look like or wants to know more, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to give you that information. Um, so those are really the only two major things that have um, happened with the council, I think, since my last newsletter went out. Any questions? I just want everyone to know that um, Megan's statement, which is fabulous, will be shared on the post office. Uh, we'll be sending a press release out so you'll be able to read Megan's remarks as well as our other elected. So I know you won't be there. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that's coming out soon. And y'all get another newsletter from me in about two weeks from now, right on March 1st. So if I miss anything, <laughs> you'll be informed in the next couple of weeks. I'll let Sergio, where's Sergio? He was on here. He seemed to have disappeared. He was right here. Yeah, did, we, did he leave? Did we leave? Uh, let me check him. I'll see if I can get him to sign back on. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, give me one second. While, uh, while we wait for Sergio, uh, we just want to do a quick save the date for our next meeting, which is going to be in April. And we're going to be hearing, it's going to be April 21st at 7 o'clock. We're going to be hearing from Assemblywoman Fahey sharing some budget updates. And there's also going to be a bunch of Earth Day related environmental native plants, that type of thing. So um, we think the, the Sustainable Advisory Committee will also be sharing a presentation. So I think it'll be a fun, interesting meeting in April. So stay tuned. While we're waiting for, for Sergio, since we now have time, I'll make a couple of shameless plugs to you all. Um, our city's summer youth work program, um, which runs for five weeks over the summer, um, is looking for job placements for our youth. Um, it, it really has to be sort of a professional um job setting professional role and, and an opportunity for those youth to expand upon um, college and career readiness uh, job skills. But the good news is, is that that 20 hour a week position from our city youth workforce is completely covered by our youth workforce grant. Um, so there are no payroll costs to those folks um, who decide to take on one of our city youth workforce individuals. I am in the process of um, working out um, and, and soliciting from our business community along New Scotland Avenue an opportunity to incorporate one of our city youth workers on a project to develop um, a welcome packet for all of the new renters that are coming into the area, both rise locations as well as some of our small time landlords of, you know, sort of mapping out the um, businesses that are within a walkable radius here in the ninth ward um, 
I spoke with Jonathan, I think last week, and he was really excited about it. One of the things that I do need to find is an individual who can help me with supervision and a work location for that young person, since they, I, I can't have them working out of my house this summer. That would not be appropriate. So if anybody has any ideas um, or has, you know, perhaps the time um, to sort of share the responsibility of supervision of that youth worker with me over the summer, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, what kind of supervision are you talking about? So they are they are working for four hours a day um, and there kind of needs to be an adult person in the building with them, somebody that they can ask questions from. You can set them up with a task to work on and, and walk away. I mean, these are these are teenagers. They don't require constant supervision, um, but we can't like stick them in a building and then have somebody not in the building with them. Um, so be in an, uh, like a conference room and somebody mm -hmm. else. Well, I mean, Rob Field has a big building. I know. I, I, I'm actually thinking about also over it would be an excellent. Yeah, they um, love working over it just to be in that building. You know. I mean, if I were, uh, I'd want to be in there. And, and Judy just texted me, the library may be a good solution for this. And I know um, Jonathan, who is the commissioner for Parks and Rec, is also in the process of speaking with the school district to see if the elementary schools would be available as a work location site that would be very neighborhood specific. The other thing I just wanted to throw at you guys is if I managed to get all of this together and buy in from the business district and we're up and running by May, um, it would be really incredible to have a ninth word young person actually working with us on this project. So if any of you have a high school student who might be eligible and for whom this might be of interest to them, um, please let me know because um, I certainly can coordinate with Jonathan to specifically pull in any of our ninth ward youth who apply to the youth workforce program on that avenue. Um, and this kind of all spilled out of uh, a, a business tour that I did with Capitalize Albany, I think two weeks ago. So it's my only other update. <laughs> so Megan, the uh, the school typically is a work site for the, the city's program. They um, do have students there, but they're supervised, I believe, uh, but they do custodial work or what have yeah, you. Yeah, no, we're, so we're looking to do... We're looking to do something that I think is much more geared towards the development of initial marketing and, and business development skills with right. the worker that we're looking for. So, but there's adults in the building, you know what I mean? So if you need a space, it might work. Yeah. And I am certainly more than capable and, and have you know, some, some flexibility with my full-time schedule to be able to meet with that young person pretty much every day to work on task stuff. So I'm not, not necessarily worried about that component, but I, they are going to need access to a computer as well. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't, I haven't heard back from Sergio. So I don't, I don't know what happened with them. I did text him. I think there are some um, Wi-Fi issues I've, I've come to note from some other people. So perhaps that's what happened because he's been on the whole time. So yeah, maybe we should move on to our last item, Ad ACPAC, please. You're muted, Amy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we met uh, the other night. Uh, we also have a monthly meeting uh, just a couple days ahead of this one, the way that it's turning out. And uh, what we are mostly working on is welcoming new members. I think we had five new uh, ACPAC members join us um, at the last meeting. So we're, uh, you know, refiguring committees and things of that nature. Um, I can tell you that the chief reported in that, you know, of the 342 budgeted officers, they're still down 62. They still have 62 vacancies. Um, you know, they're covering all the shifts. It just means that officers are really stretched thin and, um, you know, are not getting their vacation time and are often being mandated to work when they would much rather be home with their families. Uh, to, you know, try to alleviate this problem 
they've added additional um, academies throughout the year where they were typically, and any of the officers feel free to jump in and correct me, but I believe they would run maybe two uh, new recruit police training academies a year. They're now um, trying to get a, a third one in because they realize that everybody doesn't have to be sitting in the classroom at the same time. They're out for their driving training and shooting training and things like that. So they can like literally they've reconfigured so they can train more officers in a given year. Uh, they've got a class uh, coming up towards the end pretty soon. And then another one starting in uh, I think April, although it's a smaller class, they don't have as many recruits as they had hoped. And then there'll be another one again before the end of the year. Um, they also, the community liaison program that I think Violetta and maybe Judy, a couple people, maybe others have been participating in. Um, they're all, you know, again, would like more people to volunteer for that so that each one of the new recruits, uh, as they cycle through, they're actually meeting with uh, somebody in each ward. That is the whole idea of community policing is getting to know your community. So um, this is about as good a model as I've heard of. Um, and I don't know, Violetta or anybody, I I'm really curious how it's been going. It's one hour a week. Um, and obviously people can't make it every single time through, you know, 52 weeks of a year, which is why uh, they would love to have more people, more volunteers, so. Amy, I've really been enjoying it, um, meeting the different recruits and really I've been taking them all over um, the seventh ward, really trying to get them down. I drive them up and down every street and I'm really trying to share with them that every street, every block has its mayor, has a strong community <laughs> um, and that it's really, um, and that the people in our community care about their community. It doesn't matter what block or what neighborhood um, and really uh, expressing my, my sense of pride in um, my neighbors and in every block that I've ever walked down. That's great. Um, and just, so, and then also Sharon, you know, I think it's also important to, uh, to have these officers wanna live here too and be committed to the community. So, you know, I, I'll talk up our schools, which, you know, maybe today is not a great day for that, but you know, there's, um, so, uh, that's really been my bent um, and really also trying to figure out who these officers are um, and what their plans are, because that to me is also something that I think is important. Um, and so hopefully, um, you know, as the program evolves, I'd like to see where there's more um, official correspondence or communication from the mentors or from the community members on who they took out uh, who they, you know, they, we know who we took out, but where we took them, what we did, and also our feedback of what our impressions were um, of this, of the cadet. Yeah, it's great. And I, I love it. ACPAC is talking about that. You know, this is brand new. And Absolutely. thank you to everybody who stepped up and, and is uh, participating in it. And Judy, you too, you've been out with recruits. It's wonderful. Yeah, if I, if I can just chime in there, um, I got my fifth call um, today. Um, I, I've done it four times, either three or four times at this point. And, um, and they're being apologetic that they're, they're tapping me because they're having, they don't have a lot of names for the ninth ward. So Violetta does the seventh, but, but for the ninth ward, they keep on coming back to me. And I'm actually, I've been doing most of the time two recruits at the same time. They'd like to split them up. I I like having the two recruits. I take them on a tour in my car. The first time I did a walking tour, um, but it was a little bit cold um, mm -hmm. and it was quick uh, kind of thing. So um, I, I love it. I, I want to emphasize that it's a really easy thing to do. I, I had one time when I had a potential COVID exposure, so I couldn't uh, do it in another time where I was seeing my granddaughter. Um, but um, it's a really easy kind of fun thing to do. It is, so you don't have, the goal is that if somebody's not gonna do it every single Friday, that you can just sign up and do it 
you know, like maybe one Friday a month, you know, so that they have a pool of people to draw on uh, to be able to do this. I want to tell you that one of the recruits, uh, maybe three weeks ago that I drove around, um, actually has bought a house on Academy, is living on Academy. That's fantastic. Uh, yes. Uh, and a lot of them are coming from out of town. You know, like the, the guy last week that I, I did, he was from, he's from Schoharie. So this is great for them to get some exposure to this city and see that there's people who really care about their community and really neat places. I, you know, of course I talk up our neighborhood, you know, a lot, um, you know, cause I think our- That is something <laughs> we, we did talk about at the meeting is like, what, how can we help? Uh, you know, how do you get people interested in being a police officer in Albany? Uh, just, just basically the state of policing in general these days um, you know, and we don't pay as well as some other communities do. And you can go to Gelderland or go to Colony and just write traffic tickets and really not see much crime. So why do you want to be an Albany police officer? And basically it's like, why do we all want to live here? Like we all live here, right? We're all committed to our neighborhood, good, bad, everything that we've ever seen raising our kids here. So that's what we need to talk about is like why is this a good community with all of all different sides of it you know what what keeps us here that's the same thing that's going to attract new officers we hope that will come and stay that's the important thing staying here so anybody that's on this um i encourage you to i think amy's supposed to be passing along the names to um to the city for people to um, do tours of the ninth ward uh, with these guys. And, and, and let me tell you, they don't let you go over. So, you know, they're very adamant about, you know, 10 minutes of, we have to be reporting back, you know, they have something to do. So they're, you know, uh, right. uh, so it's, so it's, you know, so it's not like you're going to be late for your dinner date, you know, on a Friday night or something like so that. Oh, it's like a reverse ride along. Exactly. Yeah. You know, when they have the cop, the civilian ride with the cop, you get to do a reverse ride along and the cop gets to ride with you. Right. So that's yeah. what they're recruiting for. Yeah. Okay. And, and also, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, so, so, I'm so excited by the quality of people uh, that they're, you know, that they're getting to come in. Um, yeah, it's really like you can make it what you want it to be. I mean, it's it's interesting you said that, Leslie, about the reverse, um, you know, job. But I do it a, a little differently. Um, but um, just so you know, I've been in contact with. So I do it for the seventh ward as well, and um, I've had two recruits at a time, several times. So um, definitely, if you're interested in, in doing it, it's worthy. But um, I do it a little different perspective as a victim of a crime recently. And um, it just puts a different pers perspective to people and police so that there's always another person on the other end of things. Um, but also, there is, I was in touch with the Tim Geisel, one of the officers I work with who schedules um, at the end of the 15 week program, they do plan to come and they agreed to come to this neighborhood association meeting and give us a report out. And hopefully they can invite some recruits to talk about that and their experiences, not just from the police officer's perspective, but the recruits as well. So um, I'm definitely a big fan of the program. Okay. And Joe, okay. do you wanna? Thank you. If I could just add in a little bit here. Um... First, um, Amy represents uh, Ward 9. I used to represent also Ward 7, but I'm now an at-large member on ACPAC. I don't represent any one particular ward, but I will be directly involved with the uh, liaison partner program. I do want to emphasize that it is a pilot program right now, and I know a lot of people have had some questions or some issues about how it's been going. We're going to try to get some feedback from everybody you know, before we start the next class. So there will be a little bit extra feedback coming back and forth, but we really appreciate any feedback anybody can give. You know, you can contact us. There's a the website to get to um, and the email. So contact us and give us any ideas or thoughts because we're looking forward to those as well. 
because again, it's a pilot program and we're looking to improve it with every new class that we have. And I really appreciate anybody that's been involved in this. It is a very worthwhile program and ACPAC got involved in it and will be more involved in it in the future, mostly because it is really the basis of community policing. It's getting the police officers involved on a personal basis with members. So I just wanted to add that, thank you very much. And I also want to just one more thing, uh, the whole cadet crew, uh, maybe this is something that always happens, but they've been at the high school for some events as well, like they did with, they met um, and had a breakfast with our, J, uh, our JROTC group, and it was really wonderful. So it's great that they're making those connections also with our youth already. I had no idea this ride along program existed. Oh, it's Leslie, new. you'd be phenomenal at it. Oh. <laughs> I would think they were my children and they'd probably yell at them or something. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I have also had an opportunity to, to escort um, um, around what? the. I said, Are you sure you're old enough to carry a firearm? You know, be like, Are you over 18? Um, I, I, I also, and I, the other thing I think that's critically important that I've been able to talk with our newly incoming cadets, um, because we are somewhat unique um, in the city of Albany, given the um, that CDPC is is the kind of central location for many of our mental health patients to be discharging back into the community. So we've seen a huge rise um, in uh, supported both OPWDD and mental health apartments throughout both the 7th, 10th, and 9th wards predominantly. Um, and we also have a number of uh, actual residential programs that are licensed through OCFS, OASIS, OPWDD, and OMH. So the other, I think, critical component to this has been, a has been um, being able to have an opportunity to have conversations with officers up front about some of these unique populations and, and you know, being consciously aware of, you know, if, if you get a call and, and somebody's, um, you know, seeming to be engaging in some, some strange behavior, please be aware that these populations are here and, and keep that in the back of your mind as you start that interaction. So that hopefully, um, you know, we don't wind up with anything, you know, tragically happening with those members of our community in, in this district. Um, and I think that that component is also really incredibly important to be able to provide to cadets who are not as familiar um, with Albany or with our community. All right, well, listen, thanks everyone. There's been a lot of really good insights and, uh, you know, Joe, I think you're probably getting some feedback just from this call. This seems like a really, really valuable program. So, um, but it does seem like we need more in the Ward 9. So let's see if we can get some more folks involved. Um, but thanks for everybody who shared all these, you know, insights about that program. So we can really uh, make sure, we, hopefully the pilot will continue. It sounds like is what we really need. Um, I think then it's, it's, it's getting pretty late. I think we're, we're going to wrap it up. Um, I know we wanted to have some community comments. I know she was going to facilitate that. We ran out of time. Um, but I think we'll just say good night to everybody and thanks so much. This was a really great meeting, some really um, great feedback from everybody. And make sure you check out the chats too. Joe, Joe just put some more information there. So, all right. Any final comments before we hit the road? Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Good thank night. You. night. Toodles. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, library. Yes. No problem. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Julia, hostess, Zoom person, expert queen. <laughs> I don't know about that, but you're welcome. <laughs> All right, talk to you later. See ya.